Hi, everybody. So welcome to the webinar. We're going to get started in about a minute, but I did want to go over some housekeeping things. If you have any questions, please go ahead and use the questions box located in your GoToWebinar handy little thingy there. Uh, we will answer those questions at the end. If you'd like to tweet about the webinar, which we certainly invite you to do, please use the handle at AHA Media Group. For those of you who are attending, you will receive a recording of the webinar as well as the slides in PDF. We are going to send you an email with a survey afterwards. Please do fill that out and let us know how we can be of help to you in the future and what would have made this experience more valuable for you. And then, of course, if you have topics for the future, we would love to hear about them. That's always very helpful to us. You are in listen-only mode, but again, please do ask questions if you have any, and we will answer them at the end. Before I begin, though, I really have to give a huge thanks to Jessica Wazinski and Haley Height, who are my superheroes on my marketing team. They did everything for this webinar, and they were amazing, and I'm so happy to have them on my team. And all of AHA Media Group benefits from having them, and hopefully you will see that today. So welcome to the webinar today about how to write about difficult healthcare topics. My name is Ahava Liebteg, and I am the president of AHA Media Group. And all 48 of us who work here are very gratified to have so many of you with us today because our mission is to empower people to make the most important decisions of their lives. And I myself once had a life-threatening illness, and it made me very passionate about wanting to give people information they could use to get the important data and facts that they needed in order to make these critical decisions. And so just to put a little context around who we are and what we've been doing for the past 15 years, we're a combination of a copywriting and content strategy content marketing team. So you can see, We've written for more than 100 organizations. Um, we do copywriting for digital and print, web pages, blogs, and social media. We do digital writing training, a little taste of what you'll get today. We love to do that and to help people forge their, to better create better content experiences for their customers and forge a connection with their brand. And we also do a lot of content strategy engagement. So if you need an audit or an assessment, a competitive gap analysis, content marketing st uh, strategy or editorial calendars, we definitely hope you'll think of us the next time you need that. So now that you know about our experience and our commitment to these issues and to giving people accurate and empowering healthcare information, today we're gonna talk about why the subjects of healthcare in terms of addiction, mental health, senior care, hospice, and palliative care are so difficult, both to manage and to write about. So these issues really create this dark gray blanket of fear that people have and anxiety and this terrible loneliness. And this causes an incredible amount of isolation and a despair, which is the complete lack of hope. And we're social animals. We're not designed to feel this way. So when we're faced with having to make a really important decision about our health or an unfortunate unwanted conclusion, our first instinct may be to head straight to denial and to hide. Other people have a different approach. They sort of want to hit it head on. But no matter where a person is on their journey, eventually they're going to have to seek out answers to their questions. But unfortunately, because of the high state of anxiety that these issues cause, very often people are going to be approaching the research about these issues underneath what we call an amygdala hijack. And that term was coined by Daniel Goleman in his famous book, Emotional Intelligence. So let's talk about neuroscience a little bit today. This is the amygdala and it sits at the core of our brain and it's the structure that's most responsible for fight or flight response. So it's an ancient system that's designed to help us survive. It makes a very quick decision for us. Should I run or sh to, so that I don't get eaten or should I stay and fight? So when you look at the neuroscience of the brain, you can see that the amygdala really sits at the center of our brain and it really has control over this issue. So what happens when the amygdala gets triggered by something it senses as danger, whether or not it's a snake in your garden or the fear of a life-threatening illness? 
it's it causes us to retreat from our frontal cortex, which is where our executive functioning happens and where we think best. So it actually arrests our thinking. We cannot think straight. We're just in reactive mode. The other thing that's incredibly important to know about the amygdala is that the amygdala is where memory is encoded and from an evolutionary biology sense that actually makes sense. So they did a, um, a research study. They wanted to know how this exactly happens. How is the amygdala triggered to encode memory? And they showed a series of pictures, emotionally triggering, emotionally triggering pictures to participants. And then they showed them a different set of pictures, but they put their elbows into ice water while they were looking at that second set of pictures. Weeks later, they brought those participants back to the lab. Why those people came back, I don't know. And they were watching the second set of pictures and remembered the ones, obviously those ones better because their hands were in the ice water. And so what the researchers hypothesized, and I think they think that they proved is that when we're in pain or facing trauma, our amygdala encodes that memory more strongly. Why? So that we don't go into that situation again. The whole point is survival. And so this leaves us as with healthcare communicators with a tremendous amount of responsibility because not only are people in an extreme sense of pain, but they're also hijacked from their thinking and they're encoding the memory of our brand. So if we leave them with a bad impression, they're never going to come back. So is so that's great news, Ahava. Thanks for that. Um, nice, nice little uh Neuroscience 101, is there a way to circumvent that amygdala hijack? And the answer is obviously yes. And as writers and market, marketers and healthcare communicators, together we are going to learn today how we can circumvent that amygdala hijack and how we can help get people the information that they need. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is something called theory of mind. And the reason I wanna start there is because theory of mind is our roadmap for how we're going to begin to understand how we are going to stop this amygdala hijack. Theory of mind is an important social cognitive skill that involves the ability to think about mental states, both your own and the other person's. It also refers to the ability to understand that other people's thoughts and beliefs may be different from your own and to consider the factors that have led to those mental states. So this is complicated and unfortunately not everyone in your life might have it, but the idea of theory of mind is that somebody can understand where you're coming from and understand that you have a different point of view that's different of than your own. Now, theory of mind continues to develop as we grow and add experiences to our well of wisdom. But it is a very important concept for what we're talking about today, because when we approach people, we obviously want to try to get inside of what's actually happening for them rather than stand outside of it. So when we look at it, empathy, empathy is really a critical piece of theory of mind, really understanding where another person is coming from and that you may not be experiencing exactly what they're experiencing. Sympathy is feelings of pity for another person. So imagine the difference when your friend says to you, I really hear where you're coming from. I've had experiences like that. It's so painful. As opposed to a friend saying, wow, that's really hard. I mean, I don't have any experience with that, but you know, I'm really sorry you're going through that. It's a completely different experience for a person. So what we really want to try for is this theory of mind and empathy. But the question is, is, do we have empathy? And how do we develop empathy? So surprisingly, empathy might actually be something that not only are we born with, but we're programmed for. Researchers at Yale, including one specifically named Karen Wynn, wanted to set up an experiment to see when empathy is developed. Using six month old babies, so again, six months old, she tried to discover if babies could actually develop empathy and could tell the difference from people who help and people who hinder. Let's go ahead and watch this video together. One puppet tries but fails to get to the top of the hill, sort of struggling and, and falling back down. On alternating trials, we show infants one character who comes and bumps the climbing character up the hill. And down goes the curtain. If you're ready, up goes the curtain. On another trial, we have a character who comes and bumps the character down the hill. Down goes the curtain. And 
I'll close the curtain. And you can see um, that interaction sort of over and over again between six and 14 times. After they're sort of finished looking at it when they're nice and bored, we simply ask them to choose between the two characters. All right, great. So we are all done with that part. We're just going to have her choose between the puppets now. That one. All right, good job. That was the helpful guy, wasn't it? Astonishingly, really, we are finding that um, upwards of 80% of babies are choosing the character who is helpful um, over the character who is unhelpful. So isn't that an amazing video? I, like, I could watch that all day, but we're not going to. We're going to keep going. So what the video shows us is two really important things that help us with writing about difficult topics. Believe it or not, we are innately wired for empathy to choose the helper and to choose another to understand that another person needs help. And we want to align ourselves with that person. And also that our brains are built to understand the context of a story. Even babies as young as six months old were able to figure out that there was a narrative there of conflict versus helping. And they were able to choose who they wanted to align themselves with. We naturally want to help and we naturally want to learn through a story so that we can apply our own experiences and in context to it. So what's our goal? Always be the yellow triangle. We always want to be the helper when communicating a story and when acting inside of somebody else's experience. So our senior writer, Amy Patterell, talks about an experience that she had when she was dealing with her father's year-long illness and going in and outside of hospice. And she really beautifully puts into words this idea of theory of mind. And she explains that anytime she has to write about anything sensitive, she goes back to the emotion that she felt when she was managing her father's illness. And she thinks about that before she puts any single word on the page. I think it's so interesting that Amy says here, I insert myself into the scenario. So that's the exact thing that we're talking about when we talk about empathy and theory of mind. She understands that her role is to play the role of the yellow triangle in the story, even though she might not be writing about the exact same experience that somebody else is going through, she can put herself inside the feelings that are happening for that person and really communicate with people better. She also starts to think about what are the questions that a person would have so that she can make sure that she really gives them the information they're looking for. Because the primary question that our readers have when they come to our content about these issues is, am I going to be okay? That is really what they're looking for. And how do we help them feel like they're going to be okay? Now, I just want to say before we talk about the content that I'm going to show examples of, no one was born a web writer or a writer. Organizations and brands definitely have different ways they want to say things. We've, bl we've blinded all of the brand examples here, but I do want to show these examples as ways that we can think about content that's helpful and content that maybe isn't helpful or could be worded differently so that we really can put people at ease and stop that amygdala hijack with empathy. So this is an example. All of these are live examples that I pulled from websites on addiction, palliative care, vaccines, hospice, senior living and care. And so we see that this one starts off in a really negative tone. Addiction ruins lives and devastates families. People with addictions are more likely to get divorced, less likely to graduate from high school or college, less likely to get promoted at work, and more likely to develop diseases related to their addiction. Now, you might want to lower your volume control for what's going to happen next, because this is all in caps. Brain dysfunction is the number one reason why people fall victim to addiction, why they can't break the chains of addiction, and why they relapse. Now, what's fascinating about this is that this is actually the writer trying to build empathy. They're trying to say, you know, your addiction doesn't define you. It's really a brain dysfunction issue. But obviously the way that it starts off and the fact that it's designed with these capital letters is extremely off-putting and just creates that amygdala hijack to be even more red light than it was before the person encounters this content. So our senior writer and editor, Susanna, points out that 
you need to sort of get this into this line, this very fine line of being empathetic yet straightforward. People are looking for the information that they need, but in order for them to get it, we need to get them back into their higher cortex. We need for their executive functioning skills to come back. So if we attack them, they're going to fly. They're gonna jump right off the page. And not only that, but their amygdala is gonna encode that you're brand is not where they want to be because it feels like a lack of survival. So we want to make sure that we can do that. So how do we stop this amygdala hijack? And today we're going to build a roadmap for how we do that. Here's an example that I wanted to show of how this amygdala hijack gets stopped right away. What is home care? Love, family, home. These words are personal. They are the very words that drove your search. You're here. You're in the right place. You came to our page hoping to keep a nurturing, safe environment for you or your loved one, wherever home may be. We are here to help you sort through all of this, and we consider it a privilege to do so. You're going to be okay. The people that you love are going to be okay. That is that empathy. It's straightforward, the language is clear, but they're letting you know that you're in the right place. So let's talk about how we're going to build this roadmap for helping people get the information that they need and making sure that they aren't terrified while they do it. Here's the Game of Thrones reference you've all been waiting for. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Game of Thrones, this is Lord Peter Baelish, who was also known as Littlefinger. Uh, Littlefinger's a psychopath. You know, he is a blue square. He was definitely a baby who chose a blue square. Uh, he doesn't have an empathetic bone in his body, but he does say something very important in a conversation with another character that I think can help us build that roadmap for how we can help people understand these sensitive topics and make good decisions. And he says, chaos isn't a pit, it's a ladder. Now, when people are going through these terrible things, these terrible healthcare decisions that they may have to make, they feel like they're staring into a pit of blackness. Uh, remember the gray slides at the beginning, despair, loneliness, anxiety. It feels like a pit. And his point is, is that it doesn't have to be a pit. It can actually be a ladder. This is similar to the idea that in Chinese, the character for crisis is the exact same character as the character for opportunity. And so when we're thinking about helping people come out of this pit of despair that, me, that they may have, we want to help build them a ladder. So this ladder is called the Ladder of Information, and it's a problem-solving concept developed by an organizational psychologist named Peter Senge. You uh, spell it S-E-N-G-E. And he shows that we have a very deliberate way of how we gather information. We don't need to treat chaos as a pit. We can treat it as a ladder. We can move people from, here's the data that you need to know to help support your assumptions, and here's how we can help you make decisions by gathering that data so that you can act on that information. So this is obvious, you know, a tool that we use in user experience and content strategy. It's a persona. It gives us the ability to have laser-like focus on our audience. Who is Adam? What does he need? How does he gather information? What's his backstory? How do we develop empathy for him? But what we use the persona for when we're writing content is we use it to understand this ladder of information. So you can see here that even though it's designed in a horizontal fashion, it's a ladder. We start with why is Adam gathering data? What is he trying to learn, right? So Adam might not be in a pit right now. He might not be in chaos, but he is looking to learn information so that he can complete an action. And so what we need to do to truly understand him is to is to anticipate the questions that he is going to ask so that we can move him through our content and get him to a place where he is going to act and he is going to convert. So this is a critical part of what we need to do when we think about writing this kind of information. When we think about it as a ladder, we're moving people up from a place where they're feeling low into a place where they're feeling higher and able to make a decision. Think back to the yellow triangle. It was pushing the red puppet up the hill. The blue square was pushing it down. We don't wanna push people down the ladder of information. We wanna pull them up through the information that we can give them. And the first place that we start with that is the words that we choose. 
Now, I think a lot of us know in healthcare communication that our, we need to think about plain language. You can call it clear communication, clear English, plain English. And I think a lot of people think that that means taking complicated words and making them more simple. But in actuality, and that is a part of plain language, in actuality, what we're really trying to do when we're talking about plain language is make the syntax and the combination of words easier for people so that they can actually grasp the material that they're reading. This is some unfortunate information about literacy in the United States, but I think it's really important for all of us to be aware of it. From 1992 to, 20, to 2013, the percentage of 12th graders who scored below basic on reading achievement increased from 20 to 25 percent, while those that are above proficient decreased from 40 to 37 percent. Just to put it in really great context, the US scores 23rd in international reading assessments behind China, Estonia, and Poland. So when we look at information about these types of sensitive healthcare issues, not only are people in an amygdala hijack and not only are they feeling alone and isolated, already bringing down their literacy levels, we have to remember that marketers overestimate the amount of words that people know by 30%. So we're already going into it writing, thinking that we're writing for an audience that understands us and they don't, and they're already compromised because they're feeling so much anxiety and loneliness. So I think it's important for us to understand that if our high school English teacher would have loved that sentence, it's probably not gonna work for this audience. Look at the complex words that are inside of this content about eating disorder treatment. I just wanna go ahead and read to you the first sentence. Our philosophy, combined with a highly trained and supportive staff, helps clients of all genders work in collaboration with their treatment team to understand their eating disorder, I need to take a breath, breath <sighs> gain abstinence from behaviors, and work on any psychological issues that complicate and or perpetuate their eating disorder, th eating disorder thoughts and behaviors. This is one of the reasons we always read our content out loud, because as soon as we read it out loud, we can see where we're overcomplicating a somewhat um, something that we could take and actually make a little bit simpler. Here's another example from depression, uh, a website about how to treat depression. And you can see long words, very complex. Another one, prolonged depression can be a debilitating psychological disorder. So that's a short sentence, but there are two long words in there and that is not empathetic. Persistent, number of factors, trauma. So this is the last sort of uh, literacy map I'm gonna leave you with. As you can see, as a country, we're not really doing that well, especially a country with widespread public education. So you're probably thinking, well, Hava, this is a total bummer. Thanks a lot, it's a Wednesday. But actually what I think it does is it helps us make our commitment even more to giving people the information they need as simply as we can. It's our job as healthcare communicators. You're on this webinar, you wanna learn to get better. Let's all get better together. People need us to be as simple as possible so that they can gain the knowledge that they need to make these decisions for themselves and for their families and for their loved ones. So let's look at an example. This is from hospice care. And you can see here, again, I underline these long words. It's interesting because the first sentence here is this, you know, the name of this hospice care place helps patients and their families make the most out of every day. I don't know that I'd start there, but it is a shorter sentence. But then they just go ahead and complicate it. Our hospice care program provides expert medical care and innovative pain and symptom management to adults and children living with life limiting illnesses, yikes, mixed with compassion and gentleness that brings comfort and peace. So our senior editor, Stephanie Wilson, makes such a fabulous point here about recognizing that education can ease fear. And that's really true, right? When we have anxiety, it's because we don't know what the future holds. But as soon as we do get some information and data behind that, we start to feel better because we can develop a plan. And I love what Stephanie says here. When she begins to write or edit, she closes her eyes, takes a breath, really envisions what it would like to be in their shoes. She inhabits theory of mind. And then she says, I take that to heart and work to make my message clean, simple, 
and compassionate. You want your words to take them gently by the hand and lead them to the next step. And so if all of us could visualize together that yellow triangle reaching out a hand and pulling the person up the hill with them, up that ladder of information, so they really feel like they can get the answers to the questions that they need. Here's a beautiful example. What is hospice care? Start with the question, anticipate what the person wants to know. Hospice care is designed to provide support to you and your loved ones during the final phase of life. Hospice care focuses on your comfort and provides a better quality of life with the end goal to enable you to have an alert, pain-free life and live each day as fully as possible. Is it time? Use our self-assessment tool to find out. Not only are we leading you to the ladder, we're leading you to a self-guided tool where you can actually process this information on your own and decide if this makes sense for you. This framing of words is something that Disney knows really, really well. So when you visit one of the Disney parks and you go over to one of the guides and you say to them, what time does the park close? They respond to you with, the park is open till 9 p.m. It's such a simple, nuanced change of language, but hear how effective it is. Somebody is asking, when is my entertainment gonna be over? When does the enormous amount of money that I paid for this going to run out? And the answer is, is look at how much time you have left here. Look at how much more enjoyment you can get. And so when we are writing about these issues, we wanna really flip these types of issues and make it so that it's framed as positively as we can and as comforting as we can. Now, once we have stopped the amygdala hijack through empathy and have thought about the ladder of information that we wanna lead people on and made sure that we're using the right types of words as well as the right construction of language, let's talk about how we wanna organize the content and what it should look like for people. So as you can see, this is a wall of words coming at you. And if you read this, what you'll find is that the writer here really wanted to talk about how bad drug addiction is, which I can't can't really imagine that somebody doing research on rehab would be thinking that drug addiction is an okay thing. You don't have to tell me how terrible it is. I'm living through it right now. The person also who's writing this really wants to focus on the five-star care that this person will receive. And while that may be important to some people, I think understanding what's actually going to happen to them is probably more critical at this point in their research. So you can see when you click on heroin from that first page, it starts talking to you about how horrible heroin addiction is. I already know that. I want you to show me what it's going to be like for my loved one to go to your rehab center and get treatment for heroin addiction. So our writer and editor, Liesl, explains this really well. She says that you want to consider what the audience is actually going to do with the information once they leave. And for most people, it is going to be assessing different places, making a plan of what to do, and moving forward from there. So so Liesl really sort of zeroes in on how we want to organize our content on the page to make sure that people can grasp that information. We want to use short sentences. We want to make sure that we're using headers, bulleted lists. We want to make sure that we are using number lists and moving people again through that ladder of information through primary, secondary, and maybe even tertiary questions. Liesl also suggests creating a key takeaway section, which I think is fantastic. We're going to summarize for you what you need to know. We will provide detail, but we're going to let you know the top line items that you need to think about. Here's an example of how this is done so well. And you can tell that the writers and editors here really thought about the very detailed questions that people have about hospice. So they start at the top with general, what is hospice care? But look at how they move down the vulnerable um, issues that people might be having. Isn't using hospice the same as giving up? That's a really vulnerable question. People are thinking about this. Am I, am I giving up against my disease or my illness? Once you begin hospice care, can you leave the program? Is any hope left? And then last question, does hospice dope people up so they become addicted or sleep all the time? So the people who wrote this page really understood that people have detailed questions and they wanted to answer them for people instead of taking them on this long-winded explanation of why you might need hospice. I'm all already on the page. I don't need you to tell me why I need it. I need you to tell me what it's going to look like for me or my loved one when I get there.
Here's another example of transitional care. So when somebody comes out of the hospital after major surgery, they may have to go to rehab. And this site does a really great job of explaining what will happen to people. It actually just tells you right here, answers to common transitional care questions and gives you some pictures of what it can look like. So not only when we're writing, but also when we're thinking about the pictures and the graphics that we can use to illustrate these ideas to people, we wanna make sure that we're setting expectations and stopping that amygdala hijack. Again, anxiety comes from not knowing what's gonna happen next. Showing people pictures of what it looks like can really make them feel much, much more comfortable. So now we have our roadmap for writing about all of these different kinds of sensitive healthcare topics. And what the roadmap really starts with is use empathy to stop that amygdala hijack, build the ladder of information, use the right words and terminology and avoid long complex sentences, which we talked about, and then organize the content to answer people's questions. So now what we're gonna do is we are going to apply all of this theory and this roadmap that we talked about to the specific topics that we wanna cover here in the webinar. So let's first start with vaccines. So clearly, this is a highly politicized subject, uh, very political in the last couple of years. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of different things involved here. These are people's children's health, it's population health. So there's a lot of different um, sides, I think, of the issue and people fear, feel very complicated about it. But as healthcare communicators, it's our responsibility to communicate accurate information to people. And just throwing information like a wall of words up here isn't going to help people. It doesn't stop the amygdala hijack, is my child going to be okay? And it doesn't help people build that ladder of information. So Marty Harris, one of our senior writers and editors who's written about vaccination says that anti-vaxxers aren't malicious, they're so concerned about their kids' welfare that they let misinformation sway them. So that's theory of mind, right? She's coming at it from a different angle. I have empathy for these people. I may not agree with them. I understand that their thoughts and feelings and mental states are different than my own, but I also know that I have to deal with what the misinformation that they're putting out there. So, but Marty's point is, is that by understanding their motivations, we really do a better job of crafting communications that will resonate with the reader. So this is a fantastic example from a children's hospital of how they stop this amygdala hijack about immunizations and prepare people to learn information. Watching your child get a shot isn't easy. Boy, ain't that the truth. It's even harder if you have fears or concerns about the safety or necessity of the vaccine. So right away they communicate to the reader, you're going to be okay, we've got this, let's walk through this together. Millions of parents immunize their children each year without concern, yet some parents have heard rumors strong word there, that vaccines can cause serious health problems. And then you can see they build the ladder of information by using headers to get at the questions that people might need. Now, when we're talking about evidence-based medicine, which is healthcare that's based upon best practices and research, a lot of times our instinct, particularly those of us who are trained as journalists, is to rush to facts and figures. But if we looked at those literacy stats for reading and we compared them to math literacy stats, I think we would find the same disturbing trend. I don't necessarily think that people really understand numbers unless we put them into context. So here's an example of where this is done really, really well. Vaccines today work better than ever. So people are worried about the safety of a vaccination. Here they show that in 1980, you needed to have 15,000 antigens to get protection from seven diseases. Now they're only using 173 antigens to get protection from 16 diseases. So putting the numbers in context can really help people understand what it exactly it is that we're talking about. When you say to people, you know, 91% uh, of American babies are vaccinated against polio, well, how many American babies are born? Uh, when do they get vaccinated for polio? That math problem doesn't make any sense to me. When you say to me, vaccines save an estimated 42,000 lives every year in the US alone, three times more than seatbelts and child restraints combined, you're doing two incredible things at the same time. The first is you're saying to me, hey, 
you would put a seatbelt on your kid, right? You would never think about driving without a seatbelt. Look at how safe vaccines are. And you're also putting context around the math. So that could be one way that we really focus on writing about vaccines and other evidence-based medicine issues that can help provide context around the math literacy. So when we're writing about vaccines, we wanna research the other side. You cannot write a counterpoint unless you understand the point. So it's important when we're writing about these kind of issues that we really want to make sure we understand the other side, even though we may not agree with them at all. We want to share fact-based arguments and we want to make the numbers mean something. So now let's talk about senior care. So I think for a lot of people, this probably brings up a lot of guilt and a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety, both as the person looking for the care and as the child or loved one of the aging individual. So here's an example of where uh, I think that the, this content doesn't necessarily do a really great job of pulling people in in a way that makes them feel that the brand really cares about them. I'm focused now on the second paragraph. Our dedicated and professional staff members, which I love it when people do stuff like this because I want to go to a place where the staff members aren't dedicated and professional. But somehow in writing, we've decided that we always have to use these words. Use a comprehensive evaluation that allows them to accurately, because we wouldn't, we want to not want to inaccurately evaluate all the personal care services a loved one might require. Listen to this. Residents then pay only for the services they need. That's great, buried right there in the article. If residents, and I don't necessarily know that I love the word residents either, require more help due to Alzheimer's, dementia, or other memory loss disorders, we can assist as necessary. So you can see that they, they've sort of missed the entire point of the subject matter that they're writing about. This is senior care. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I saw this one. Actually, in the navigation menu itself, it says, services and fees. Now, some people might say, hey, how do you know they're being straightforward? They want to let people know how much it costs. But I don't necessarily know that putting that into the navigation item is probably the way you want to go. Obviously, we want to get to fees. People have to pay for this care, but I don't know that putting it up there right away is a really great way to go. So Mary Tyndall, our writer, says this is a population, and not that all populations don't deserve this, but we really don't want to be condescending to them, and we really need to treat them with dignity and respect. Emotions are high, so we need to meet our audience where they are through helpful content that's kind without being condescending. We should also avoid stereotypes about aging. It's very important. Choose our thoughts, our words thoughtfully, keeping empathy and connection top of mind. So here's an example where I thought they did this really well. This is a center that specializes in helping people with memory disorders. And they give very specific details in the bullets. Remember what Liesl said about organizing the information? It really helps to be able to zero in on what you want to know about what the details are of the care. So if you look at activities, the last two bullets, light and music therapy to alleviate and lessen symptoms of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Fantastic. That's giving me really important details. And then residents are kept active, engaged with exercise classes such as balance, stretch, and strength training. So what we learn from this is that we really want to provide people with the detail that they need to make these decisions, but also to understand what's going to happen once their loved one gets there helpful content. This is like the classic example. We know that it's very dangerous for um, the aging population to fall, can create a lot of really big problems for them, obviously real um, threatening healthcare risk. And so this is a fantastic checklist that you can use in your home to make sure that your loved one doesn't fall. Now, I love this way of approaching it. It's a little bit tongue in cheek. They obviously know their audience really, really well, but um, this is for an assisted living facility. And so this is the way that they approach it. Remember when you were told that the world doesn't revolve around you? Well, as a resident at this place, it kind of does. Right from the get-go, your loved one will have team members who fast become friends and dedicate themselves to their every need. Here, elders have opportunities to learn, laugh, and grow, and engage in their passions. And they set the pace because, after all, it's all about them. So I, I find it actually really sort of interesting the way they switch from it's about you to it's about your loved one. I don't know that I love the word elders. It kind of conjures up like post-apocalyptic 
apocalyptic scenes in my head, but I do appreciate the fact that they're really trying to find other language to describe uh, this population. So I think this is an example of where you can interject a little bit of lightness into the things that you're talking about. So when you're writing about senior care, it's really important to remember that you have those two audiences, the senior and the caretaker. You definitely want to wait, stay away from trendy terms, right? Like FOMO is not going to work with this audience. And then you could use stories of similar people. I think that that does help to create empathy to show them this person's like you, you know, let me show you an example of somebody who had the same choices that you do. And let's, and you can make a decision based on that story. If this is the right place for you, or this is the right care team you need. Now I want to talk about hospice. There's a lot of content about hospice online. Um, this next paragraph almost makes me want to cry. Uh, facing a life-limiting illness can be devastating physically, emotionally, and spiritually. When a patient has made the choice to stop aggressive or life-extending treatment for a progressive or incurable illness and wants to be comfortable and not in pain, then hospice care will provide a great benefit. Now, I don't know about you, but not only is my amygdala hijacked, but I'm walking into my bed, curling up into a ball and crying for the next three hours, and I haven't even gotten to the second paragraph. This next piece of content just makes me angry. Cost for in-home in care in the hospice environment. I'm going to read the whole thing to you because I, I want you to get the full feeling for it. There are no additional charges for hospice and home care until the time comes for nurse delegation. At that time, you will be billed separately for the nurse's time to delegate the tasks, estimated at $200 to $1,000 depending on the circumstances, and your regularly hourly rate will increase by 10% for the remainder of the time. Typically, nurse delegation does not happen until the latter part of the hospice process. I promise you this is online right now and thus does not continue for very long, typically two weeks or less, but this varies. If you want to keep your costs down, make sure not to schedule a nurse delegation after hours on weekends or holidays. Remember that family members are allowed to assist with these tasks and are not subject to the same regulations. I mean, you almost want to like laugh or cry here. Please ask for our helpful booklet when death is near. Okay, this is no, do not do this. Uh, Mary Mosteller, who's the Director of Development and Public Relations at Care First New York, explains that our job when we're talking about hospice is to empower our audience to advocate for themselves and their loved ones. We have to be brave enough to have the conversations that matter, not about the nurse delegation and not about the fee and not about how this is the most horrible, devastating, terrible thing that's happening. We know that already, help us make decisions. She also points out that our culture has made death and dying a taboo subject, and that what we really need to do is help people have these kinds of conversations, give them a framework for how they can do that so that they can feel empowered as their own healthcare advocates. Even doctors today are changing the way that they talk about death and dying. Doctors need to see illness and death as an opportunity for societal and personal growth instead of a societal and personal failure. Unfortunately, we're all going to die. There's nothing we can do about that. So we need to be able to talk about that in an open and compassionate way. Here's the way you do it. When we first meet with you, we will ask you what your hopes are. It is our mission to support your wishes in every way so you can live the way you want and do the things that are important to you. Your goals are the focus of the hospice team. Together, we will design the care that will achieve your goals. Amygdala hijack stopped right in its tracks. Now we're gonna build the ladder of information from you. We use simple words, we used plain English, and we're going to help you now organize your thoughts around what you have to do next. Now what's interesting is that because our language around this is evolving, the terms that people use to search this information is always evolving, which always creates um, interesting challenges for the healthcare marketer. So some of the terms that we see now are comfort care and end of life care. 
You know, there's an example that we use very typically that I think is a great, you know, sort of example that works in this situation also. Doctors prefer the term hypertension, but obviously consumers uh, prefer the term high blood pressure. And since it's still called hospice and that, that term may change, we always want to make sure that we're doing our keyword research to make sure that we're finding out what our audience is calling it. So audiences may not like the term hospice, but that's still how they're finding the information. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are um, researching those keywords and making sure that we are using the terms that people are going to look for. So you see her, I just did a quick search in Google Trends. I did use palliative care because we're going to see later that people confuse those two terms, palliative care and hospice. And then we're also going to see how um, comfort care and end of life care are not being used, but they are starting to move up up that um, in that trend. So we want to keep a careful eye when the language around these topics is evolving. So when we're writing about hospice, we don't want to be afraid of the subject. We want to approach it with compassion, but be straightforward. We want to use evolving language, but balance the needs of the SEO that we're doing research about. And we want to guide our reader through decision-making steps. Now I wanna go ahead and talk about palliative care. So this is a fascinating approach. The palliative care program at Blank is designed to meet the needs of patients with serious illness. Now that's pretty clear and straightforward. However, here come the zombie healthcare marketing words. I don't know what happens. Like, do we teach writers that you have to include this in every piece of content? Palliative care is a coordinated, comprehensive, multidisciplinary approach to patient care. I don't know what those words mean, except maybe coordinated. Our team cares for patients at any stage of an illness and works together with the patient's physicians to help lead and coordinate care between the physicians and other care providers. I'm going to do a live rewrite for you right now. Our team cares for patients at any stage of illness, period. We work together with the patient's doctors to coordinate care, period. That's all you needed to say. It's the exact same meaning explained much better. So our uh, senior writer and editor, Jenna Triggs here, explains that you wanna ask your subject matters about what the right labels are to put on conditions about sensitive topics. Our writers rely on online forums to find out what patients are thinking and feeling and the words that they're using around these sensitive issues. Here's a great example, palliative care. This um, hospital makes a really great um, not even attempt, they manage to explain the difference between palliative care and hospice care in a really fantastic way. So when we're writing about palliative care, we want to focus on educating our audience and clear up any misconceptions. Palliative care is not the same as a hospice. Palliative care is to sort of help people who are going through a major illness to feel as comfortable as, as possible. Hospice is for end of life and comfort care treatment. We want to focus on the benefits to the patient of palliative care, and we want to explain the details and different support services. Obviously, palliative care has a lot of different specialists involved. So mental health is obviously a huge issue in this country, and you can see that this uh, content around it is probably not helpful, both for the design of it and the words that they're using about compulsive hoarding. And so what Kirsten says to do is to really talk to subject matter experts about these stigmatized conditions so that we can chip away at their stigma and really understanding that distinctions matter. And she gives the list of some different um, associations that you can go to to learn about what the latest terms are in mental health and mental wellness. Now, it's so interesting to me how we talk about mental health in this country because we assume that it's the person's fault. This is the biochemical process that happens in the pancreas of a person with diabetes. And this is the biochemical process that happens in a person's brain when they have depression. Please explain to me why these are different. Imagine if somebody said to a person with diabetes, I don't understand why you can't control your insulin. Like all you gotta do is eat right and exercise and get more sleep. And maybe you should hang out with your friends more or meditate, maybe that'll help your insulin. Or if we said to a person who wears eyeglasses, gee, I'm really sorry you're nearsighted. Maybe you need to do more eye exercises. You know, you can't drive, you can't read, sorry. You know, that's tough. I'm sure you're gonna be able to work it out. You would never say that to somebody. So why is it that when we talk to people who are suffering from any of these mental health disorders that we don't give them the same pass, so to speak? It's a biochemical process that they can't control. Here's a great example of how to write about this. 
It's normal to feel depressed every once in a while, but when depression, when depression starts to affect your daily life and the lives of those close to you, that's when you need to seek help. Okay, we're pulling in the squad here now. It's not just you, it's the people you love and the people that love you. We understand, theory of mind right there, struggling with depression is frustrating and traditional treatment with antidepressants doesn't always work. In fact, over half of depressed patients don't get better after taking antidepressant medication. I think most people understand uh, the math literacy behind half. One size does not fit all, right? You're unique. We understand your experience might be different. Different Treatment that works for one person won't work for everybody, and it could even make you worse. Here is a genius example of how to write about mental health in a way that takes math without a picture and explains it to people really, really well. Before we start looking at what OCD is, I want you to understand that about one in 100 people have OCD. Some estimates are as high as one in 40. That's a lot of people. If you go to a Phillies game on a good day, there are more than 40,000 people there. At one out of every 100, that is 400 people. So you are certainly not alone. No need to label this either. Please know that while you may have OCD, it is treatable and does not reflect who you are. You are not weak. Some of the most courageous people I have met with OCD, the, some of the most courageous people I have met have OCD. You are not your OC, but you may have it. Now it's interesting to see how we're looking with search at behavioral health. So you can see here, I looked at the people also ask at Google and people did not use the synonyms mental health. What's fascinating is that the American Psychiatric Association makes a difference between mental health and mental illness. Mental health involves executive functioning, effective functioning in daily activities, whereas mental illness refers collectively to all diagnosable medical, mental disorders. So again, from an SEO perspective, you wanna make sure that you're using the terms that your audience is familiar with, even though they, those may not be the terms that are evolving within the language of the discipline that you're dealing with. So in order for people to find your content, you may have to use older terms that we used to use, but when you're talking about it, make sure you use the evolved terms. So when we write about mental health, we wanna avoid language that stigmatizes a person with bipolar disorder or better yet, a bipolar sufferer, not someone who is bipolar. Again, stories can be very helpful at helping people feel that hope and you wanna carefully consider your SEO options. So our last topic is talking about addiction. So again, starting off negative, right? The park, what time does the park close? Choosing a drug or alcohol rehab center for yourself or for a loved one can be an overwhelming and difficult process. Wait, the amygdala hijack gets even better. They're, they're amping it up. Unfortunately, with the rise of the opioid epidemic, the addiction treatment field has seen an influx in deceptive marketing and unethical practices by drug rehab providers who only concern appears to be monetary gain. This leaves many consumers confused and distrustful about where and how to find effective treatment options options. Thanks a lot. Not only am I going through something really difficult, but you're about to tell me that I'm about to get scammed too. So Melanie Haber, who's the Senior Vice President of Brand and Communications at American Addiction Centers, really explains to us that we have to avoid this stigmatized language and we need to make sure that we really talk to the human that's suffering behind these issues. And so here's a better way to do this. Drug and alcohol addiction is more than just occasionally dabbling in a substance. When you find that you need more and more of a substance to get high, that's a very simple definition of addiction. Have intense urges for a drug or alcohol or that your life revolves around seeking out and using drugs or drinking, it's likely addiction has taken hold. It can be difficult to stop using on your own. Stop the amygdala, give people empathy, start building the ladder of information. I love the way this picture sort of takes the isolation out of feeling so alone in this issue. Meet Sam using a story. After struggling with mental illness, substance abuse, and homelessness, Sam found blank. Isn't that a better way of saying addiction causes all these terrible things? Now he's moving in a new direction. So when we write about addiction, we wanna separate the person from the disease, not an addict or a substance abuser, but a person with a substance abuse disorder, very similar to the stigmatized language around mental health issues. 
you want to connect the mental health aspects. So research shows us that addiction is definitely a mental health issue. And again, that takes it out of the control of the person. The familiar language we all know is, I'm blank, I'm an addict. But we're moving maybe away from that language to really focus on the disease, not the person. And we also want to avoid words in terms like clean, or which makes drug addict, you know, drug use dirty, abuse. We want to try the word misuse instead, and obviously fall off the wagon is something that we want to avoid. So here are some of the themes just to sum up that we covered today. You want to get empathetic. You can connect. You know, these things might not have happened to you or someone that you know or love, but you can find a way in from theory of mind. You're programmed for it. You want to educate people and give them information so that they feel less anxiety and more empowered. You want to use the right word choices, making sure that you're balancing what, what we used to call things with what we're calling them now to make sure people can find your content. You want to ask questions in a very clear flow and give people the answers that they're looking for. And you really want to have a laser-like focus on your customer and not your brand. It's really not about you. It's really about them. And finally, I think the best picture I can give you in your head is be that yellow triangle, extending your hand to somebody and pulling that up the ladder of information. So we're at the end of the webinar. I do want to give you this free ebook that you can see in the link in your chat. And if you don't see it there, you will be able to um, get it. We're going to send out an email with the slides, the video, and the link to the ebook. But I really hope you will download it. It is incredible. It is chock full of information about how to write about these topics, how to get at your audience. It talks about this roadmap. Um, really, we talk a lot about empathy and making sure that people are getting the information that they need. Again, when you receive your email, you're getting a lot of stuff from us, right? Please do fill out the survey and let us know how we can make both the experience of registering for the webinar. I know the link came out an hour before. Some people were nervous about when they were going to get it, um, about um, what you learned today, if it helped you, what else we can write about for you. And please go ahead and start putting questions in the question box if you have any. And then finally, these are the sources that I used for the webinar. I do want to recommend this book by Alan Alda. If I understood you, would I have this look on my face? Really valuable for any healthcare communicator or writer who wants to get better. And at this point, I will go ahead and ask some questions. Answer some questions. Um, okay. Wow, there are quite a lot here. All righty. Okay, this is, in general, when you acknowledge the person as in you need this versus they need this, should content, hmm. it's hard for me to see this. Hmm. I'm having some technical difficulties here. I apologize. Ah, here we go. Okay. Can you touch on writing content for government medical sites that address multiple stakeholders, other health providers and researchers? Absolutely. So there was a famous study done by the NIH, the NIH where they gave people access to information for patients and for physicians. And what they found were that patients actually went and read the physician healthcare information because they were worried that that information was buried from them and that they weren't going to be able to see it. So I think it's important that when you're talking to multiple stakeholders to let them know, are you a physician and let them guide that process for themselves if you can. In general, when you acknowledge the person as in you need this versus they need this, should the content be more personalized? I think that, you know, we saw with that example of the home care, it doesn't revolve around you. I think it was a little jarring when we saw the change between I'm talking to you about your loved one versus I'm talking about, you know, you as the person making the decision. And I think that, you know, I, I'm not really sure. Um, how you can do that really well, except to sort of organize the information so that you're speaking at one point directly to the person making the decision, and then you're speaking to the next person who might be um, who might be involved in making the decision. Um, diabetes is stigmatized in the way you mentioned in your example. 
people are blamed for developing diabetes, especially when it comes to type two diabetes. I actually think that that's a really interesting point. And I do think that that's something that people would say. However, I don't necessarily think that somebody would expect somebody who needs insulin not to get the treatment that they need, where I do think that mental health disorders are stigmatized even more than that. What word would you use in place of clean for somebody with drug abuse issues? So we talk about synonyms that you can use specifically in the ebook, and um, we talk about um, you know um, not um, not being a, not using the word junkie, making sure that you are talking about people that um, are not involved right now or that are having success with their substance abuse disorder. You mentioned online forums to learn what verbiage to use around certain illnesses. Do you have any tips about how to find these forums? Yes, you can do a search and find different associations that specifically deal with certain disease states, and you can find all sorts of forums. What I will caution you against is listening to everybody on a forum. You do wanna make sure that you are listening to the patients who are asking legitimate questions and people who just aren't really there to, um, to sort of whine and complain constantly and who seem to, to, to not be asking questions that are really helpful for people. Anyway, we have reached the two o'clock mark and I do wanna be respectful of everybody else's time. So we will answer any leftover questions um, to people directly. But again, you see my information and contact information on the slide and I'm more than happy to, to answer those questions to you privately. I really appreciate that you were all here. Again, please do feel free to download that ebook and to answer that survey and let us know how we can make this even better for you in the future. And hopefully we will see you at our next webinar. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.